Accomplishing a vision will require enough commitment to overcome the obstacles. We have been looking through the book of Nehemiah. We have uh, looked at it from the point of view of the vision that God gave Nehemiah and what it takes for us to follow a vision and allow God to use us as he wants to use us. I've said before, Nehemiah is kind of a regular guy like us. He doesn't receive visions from God. God doesn't speak to him. But God nonetheless uses him and his abilities to accomplish a great feat. Now, accomplishing a vision will require total commitment. You cannot attempt to accomplish a vision half-heartedly. doesn't usually work. Accomplishing our vision will require sacrifice and risk. We will have to give up what we think is good. There's a lot of good things filling our lives and our time and our money and efforts. We need to be willing to give that up for the best, for what God really wants for us. It'll be necessary for us to commit to that which is uncomfortable sometimes for us and unfamiliar territory uh, to change and so on. I think we've seen that already in this book and we'll continue to see that. Vision requires the commitment of a parachutist. You don't sort of parachute. <laughs> you don't sort of skydive. They're putting together a documentary, I think, of this guy who took the helium balloon way to space and jumped out and, you know, broke the sound of speed, sound of sound barrier. That's what it is. Speed of sound barrier with his own body. You don't halfway do that. A total commitment, right? Now, I haven't done that. Uh, Warren and Mariah aren't here this morning. A couple weeks ago, they parachuted, so uh, we could uh, talk to them. They are at a wedding this weekend. But uh, another thing that I have experienced is repelling. You don't halfway repel. You know, you have to get up at the edge of that cliff, and you've got your rope attached to a tree or rock or something, and you've got to be willing to step off over the edge of that cliff and walk down the side of that cliff, trusting that rope to hold you. I was there my first time and watched a father-son do it, and the father let his son go first over the edge, and they both got down to the bottom, and the father said, I grew significantly as a father watching my son step over that edge. <laughs> this is something that you commit to all the way. A vision is something we need to be committed to so that you and I can overcome the obstacles and hindrances and all the things that Satan and his demonic forces in this world and all will put in our way. Is there something you know God really wants you to do? What is that? Are you willing to sacrifice to see his will accomplished? That's what we're talking about. So, accomplishing a vision will require enough commitment to overcome obstacles. And this morning, I want you to go away with this truth. In order to accomplish our vision, we must overcome hindrances. If we allow them to stop us, we will not be able to overcome them. Now, as we come back to the story of Nehemiah, last week we saw how he's able to share that vision and how he shares not only what needs to be done, but why it needs to be done and why it needs to be done now. And he's got to give them a vision that this could be and should be. And the people rose up and said, we want to build. Well, now they have to follow through. And so the rest of the story of Nehemiah, quite a bit of it, is them following through. And of course, things don't go real smoothly, right? That's you and I live in real life, and we know that. So Nehemiah, first of all, has to deal with some opposition, some false accusations of his workers. And he does that by reinstating or reemphasizing his confidence that God would give them success. I want, we're going to, this is kind of different here this morning and how we're going to cover uh, lots of scripture. So I've asked CJ to come up and read, first of all, now this morning, Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. You follow along as he reads that. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing? you are doing will you rebel against the king so I answered them and said to them the God of heaven himself will prosper us therefore we his servants will arise and build 
but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Thank you. First of all, there are enemies. Just like today, there are enemies around the city of Jerusalem who do not want to see Jerusalem prosper under the hands and direction of the Jews. And it's no different back in this day. And we're introduced to some of these guys. Uh, we've got some names here. Sanballat, we've heard his name before. Uh, and Tobiah, we've heard his name before. Now they've recruited another guy, uh, Geshem, the Arab. And if you were to look at a map, you'd see that these countries uh, or peoples were surrounding Jerusalem, really. And during the 70 years of captivity, they have sort of come to power and had a lot of influence over this whole area of Judea. And they don't want to lose it. Is that familiar? Leaders who don't want to lose influence and power? Well, that's their problem. So they start, first of all, they're looking for ways to stop this project. And they start by using demoralizing techniques, everything they can think of. And so first of all, they uh, get their army together and they do this in a very public way. And obviously they do it in a way that reaches the people of Jerusalem. I don't know if they're close enough to hear or if they make sure that the news is going to travel. But they want the people of Jerusalem to hear their comments when they laugh at them and despise them and say, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? I mean, are you going to rebel against the king? The king's past law is that this law cannot be rebuilt. Now, of course, uh, Nehemiah has already told them the king has given them permission now to do it, but they're still trying to you know, raise up that fear from before. You tried this once before, you're not going to get it done the second time either. You know, what is the problem? Secondly, verse 20, uh, answer, excuse me, um, and so now we have Nehemiah's answer to that, to this ridicule, to this uh, accusing of the Jews. And Nehemiah, of course, comes back to keep his eyes focused on God and God's vision, his faith in God and God's ability to help them succeed. So I answered them, verse 20, and said to them, the God of heaven himself, now throughout the Babylonian and Persian captivity, this is the term that's used by Daniel and the prophets, the God of heaven, the ultimate creator, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Nehemiah says, we are not going to change our plans. We're not going to stop with your threats and your belittling and all of that. Uh, we are going to continue. We're going to build like we said we we're going to do, like God wants us to. He's going to enable us to do it. And then notice he says, but you... He sends this message to his enemies, these you know, regional rulers. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Now, notice a couple things Nehemiah does and doesn't do in this answer. He doesn't ignore their accusations and just not address them at all. I mean, just to ignore them would have let those rumors fester among the people. Or Jerusalem would pass it around, said, oh, they think we aren't going to do this anyway, and maybe they're right, and you know, all of that self-doubt it would have created. And uh, perhaps their accusations would have had the intended purpose. No, Nehemiah needs, knows it needs to be addressed. He needs to be honest about uh, admitting they said that and deal with it. Secondly, Nehemiah does not waste his time debating, debating these men. He doesn't go call a conference and go out and debate them and say, well, now what you're saying is wrong, and why? Well, he knows all that, but he doesn't waste his time. He doesn't let it sidetrack him. Uh, he doesn't allow this, his focus to shift to answering his critics. <clears throat> Why is that important? We have a tendency to allow that. We have a tendency to focus only on the problems. Nehemiah didn't do that. Oh, he knew there were problems, but he didn't focus on them. He kept his focus on the vision. Nehemiah did not invite these enemies to join in with the work. And we'll find out later in the book they probably wanted that. Uh, they had some ties. They were intermarriage and so on. And so they had some Jewish influences. We'll find out. And they probably wanted to be a part of the project, probably to you know, waylay it, delay it, do everything they could to destroy from the inside. Nehemiah says... You have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. You don't have any heritage or right today. It is not your project. Jerusalem is not your city. God gave it to the, the Jewish people. And you didn't have in the past either. You don't have any memorial here. It's our people who are buried here. It's God's city. 
Wouldn't that be helpful if we as a world recognize that today? Yes, it would. So, Nehemiah keeps his focus and the focus of his people clearly on the task at hand and the fact that God was helping them. They should not depend on their own abilities, human resources, or personal genius. Therefore, Nehemiah could be confident in coming success because it was God they were obeying. Nehemiah wasn't discouraged by, their, uh, by, by this opposition. Warren Wiersbe says, The things people say may hurt us, but they can never harm us unless we let them get into our system and poison us. If we spend time pondering the enemy's words, we will give Satan a foothold from which he can launch another attack closer to home. The best thing to do is to pray and commit the whole thing to the Lord, then get back to your work. Anything that keeps you from doing what God has called you to do will only help the enemy. Nehemiah defends the rightful owners of the city and its project, and he also refocuses them on God's ability. A man is measured by what it takes to stop him. That's a saying. What does it take to stop you from what you know God wants you to be doing? Warren Wiersbe said, opposition is not only an evidence that God is blessing, it is also an opportunity for us to grow. I want to point out a verse in the New Testament. Nehemiah didn't know this, but you and I do. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Nehemiah, with the first opposition, uh, keeps the focus, his focus and the people's focus on pushing ahead, on let's get started on this project. Let's not let these enemies waylay us or change our focus. Then in chapter 3, Nehemiah gives credit to those who helped to accomplish the goal. Wow, Nehemiah is the kind of humble leader who did not take the credit for himself. He gives the credit to the people, the workers, and to God. And you know what? We might be tempted to skip over this chapter. I mean, this is a chapter filled with hard names and places and all of that. But if God wanted to record these names for all of eternity and give them credit for their work on this important project, then we ought to read it. And that's why I've asked CJ to read this difficult chapter this morning. Now, as he comes, let me help you watch for some things. Listen through this chapter. We're going to see different kinds of occupations involved, different uh, things they did for which they're praised, so on. Listen to this, all right? Come and read for us. Chapter 3. <laughs> Let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, then Eliashab, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hananel. Next to Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zechur, the son of Imri, built. Also the sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Kaz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berakai, the son of Meshazabel made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Bannon, made repairs. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their lord. Moreover, Jehoiada, the son of Pasia, and the Meshulam, the son of Basodia, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Melatiah, the Gibeonite, Jaden, the Merothite, and the men of Gibeon in Mizpah repaired the residence of the governor of the region beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Heruiah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs. Also next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. And they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. And next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, leader of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Jedidiah, the son of Heramoth, made repairs in front of his house. And next to him, Hadash, the son of Hashabaniah, made repairs. Malachijah, the son of Haram, and Hashbub, the son of Pahath and Moab repaired another section, as well as the tower of the ovens. And next to him was Shalom, the son of Halohesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem. He and his daughters made repairs. 
Hannah and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired it a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuse gate. Malachijah, the son of Rechab, leader of the district of Beth Hakarim, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Shalon, the son of Kol Hosea, leader of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and bars, and repaired the wall of the pool of Shelah by the king's garden, as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, leader of half the district of Beth Zer, made repairs as far as the place in front of the tombs of David, to the man-made pool and as far as the house of the mighty. After him, the Levites under Rehum, the son of Bani, made repairs. Next to him, Hashabiah, leader of half the district of Keilah, made repairs for his district. After him, their brethren under Beveah, the son of Henadad, leader of the other half the district of Keilah, made repairs. And next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section in front of the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabiah, carefully repaired the other section from the buttress to the door to the, of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimuth, the son of Uriah, the son of Kaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him, the priests, men of the plain, made repairs. And after him, Benjamin and Hashrub made repairs opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs by his house. After him, Benua, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress, even as far as the corner. Palal, the son of Uzziah, made repairs opposite the buttress and on the tower which projects from the king's upper house that was made by the court of the prison. After him, Pedadiah, the son of Perush, made repairs. Moreover, the Nethanim, who dwelt in Ophel, made repairs as far as the place in front of the water gate, toward the east, and on the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites repaired another section next to the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Beyond the horse gate, the priests made repairs, and each each in front of his own house. And after them, Zadok, the son of Immer, made repairs in front of his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. After him, Hananiah, son of, the Sh of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaph, repaired another section. After him, Meshalam, the son of Berechiah, made repairs in front of his dwelling. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of Nethanim, and of the merchants in front of the Mipkad gate, and as far as the upper room at the corner. And between the upper room at the corner, as far as the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and their merchants made repairs. Thank you. He deserves a hand for that. <laughs> he is a brave man. <laughs> well, all those names. Obviously, Nehemiah is a very organized leader, and he delegates the work in an organized manner. In fact, here is a picture of what we think the wall was. Now it's just the solid black line there was what they were doing on the right. And really his description starts in the top northeast corner and goes counterclockwise around that whole wall as to who did what section of the wall. I hope you listened and heard over and over again, repair, 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 and next to their house, next to their house. That was wise. They didn't have very far to commute to work. Some of you would appreciate that if your boss knew that as well. They didn't have to commute to their work. They didn't waste time and energy. The whole family could be involved in the work. And obviously they were preparing the wall next to their house. And so they didn't want that to be the weak link in the chain, the spot where the enemy could break through at their house. And so they were motivated to build that wall to the best of their very ability. Commuters from outside the city were assigned sections of the wall where there were few homes. And, uh, you know, they were out in the villages. But remember, in those kinds of days, if you go to Europe, older parts of the world today, you still see walled parts of the city in the middle. Well, all the people in the villages around when the enemy came would all run into the city. So it was to their benefit as well to build this wall and have a place to run if there was an attack. Some of the assignments were made by vocation. The priests, it says, were assigned to rebuild the sheep gate. 
Well, they had a special interest in that because that's where all the animals brought in for sacrifices, through that gate. And so they were assigned there. And there's goldsmiths and perfume makers. They're not normally builders. Everybody's involved, no matter what their um, occupation. Rulers, regional rulers of the city, Levites, merchants, everybody involved. And then notice in this chapter that Nehemiah records different levels of effort. It's interesting, verse 12, one man's daughters were involved. Now, maybe he didn't have any sons, and so he rallied his daughters to work. Well, equality there. How about that? They're building the wall as everyone else is. The refusal of the nobles at Tekoa to go up to help rec records their pride it says they refuse to bend their neck there for all eternity is uh, this record that these leaders out in this village would not help that's not that's beneath us work and uh, for all of eternity there it is but look at the people of this village even if their leaders said we're not going to get involved they not only had one part of the wall, they built two parts of the wall, two separate sections. These people from this village, a town about 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Their special effort, notice in verse 20, assigned to Baruch. It's recorded that he carefully repaired. Well, now the term carefully doesn't mean detailed like we might think of it. It's a word associated with fire. It's, uh, it, it's like he had a fiery zeal in his repair of his wall, and so his effort is specially recognized there. All kinds of people, all kinds of talents. You know, you and I could learn from this. In the church and the Great Commission and all that God has to do today, with every kind of believer, with all of our talents, all of our gifts, all of our abilities, everybody can be involved in some way to get God's project done. And you know what Nehemiah has done in recording these people's names and what they accomplished? He has for all of eternity recorded their efforts and their accomplishment. Isn't that just like God? who is waiting Jesus Christ with eternal rewards for all his servants, believers, the bride of Christ, for all that they do in serving him, faithful, faithful servants. And he will offer an eternal reward someday, which will stand for eternity, just like these people. So I think that's instructive for us to take away from that chapter uh, those things and to why we have that in Scripture. But now moving on to chapter 4. Nehemiah, it's important that we see, he has a vision that he does not give up. He never changes that. But he does, he is willing to adapt his plan when he has to do that. Those of you that missed Adult Bible Fellowship this morning, you missed out on a privilege of having Diane share about what's happening on the mission field and their vision. Wow, you heard a demonstration there, a vision. And that we have to adapt to the world in which we live. And we have to adapt our vision and do, you know, the vision's the same as far as serving God, but how we go about it must adapt to our situation in our country and the world in which we live. Now, first of all, we see that uh, Nehemiah is going to again experience hindrances and we want to see how he adapts to them so I've asked Laurel to come and read now uh, the next portion of Scripture chapter 4 yeah. all right but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews and he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, 
the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ash Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were be being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God, and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our advers adversary said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings and set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And it happened, when our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held the weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us here our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Thank you, Laurel. Here we see Nehemiah never detracted from the vision, but having to change his plans time and time again. And we can learn from it. First of all, he overcomes ridicule of his workers with prayer and action and greater diligence in the work, verses 1 through 6. The enemy ridicule the workers. Look at what they say, uh, especially this um, Tobiah. <laughs> Whatever they work, even if a fox jumps on it, it will break the stone wall down. How, before that, verse 2, I mean, how, what are these feeble Jews doing? They're not builders. What can they expect to rebuild this wall? Will they offer sacrifices? They're going to need prayer. It's only going to be miraculous if they get it done. Nehemiah agreed with that, by the way. He trusted God to help them. Will it be complete in a day? They have no clue as to how big this project is. Who would start such a thing? They revive stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned. Look at the materials they're working with. On and on they criticized everything they could find out to criticize. What is Nehemiah's response? Remember, over and over and over and again in the book, this is a man whose response, first of all, is prayer. Now, you know, these enemies, it says, are angry. They are furious at the Jews rebuilding this wall. Well, Nehemiah's not very happy either with their ridicule, but he goes to God with it. And he has some strong things to pray about these guys, right? We've talked about that as he studied prayer. Um, David did too. He poured out his emotions to God, but his first inclination is to pray always and then to act. And that's what Nehemiah does. Prayer was a distinct and consistent part of Nehemiah's approach to problem solving. It needs to be ours as well. And then he continued to work. He stayed focused on the task. And they were able to finish half the project very quickly. The walls are half the height they need to be. Some Christians pray and then sit and wait for God to do something without their help. That's not how God has chosen to work. God could have sent the angels, 
couldn't he? He could send the angels to give the gospel, but he didn't do that. He gave us a great commission. He wants us to take the gospel to every person. And so we need to both pray and work. And that's what ne Nehemiah has this balance figured out. We're going to pray. We're going to trust God. We know we're totally dependent on him. We're going to pray about our enemies and all the hesitations and hindrances they want to put in our path. But we're going to work as hard as we know how to work. And if we need to change our plan to adjust to them, we will. But we're going to keep going. And God wants to supernaturally use your human efforts in your marriage. No, God's not going to change your marriage without your help, without your work, without your sacrifice, without your initiative, or your family as you parent, or your work, or your school, or your neighborhood, or the world, or this local church. God is not going to simply, miraculously do it all himself. He wants us. He gives us the vision as to what we need to do in order to carry out his work his ministry. And so we have to do our very best and trust him. Now also, Nehemiah is not stubborn and says, okay, this is my plan. I'm going to stick to it. And uh, even if we get overrun by the enemy or whatever, that's just the way it's going to be. No, he needs to shift. He needs to change. And we see that in the next section where Nehemiah overcomes a plot to attack the workers with, again, prayer and beginning to up the security. Verse 7, it happens that these guys, they hear the walls are being restored and being closed, and they're very angry. They are furious. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. If we had a map here, we'd see that these guys surrounded this city. All of these armies, and now they're conspiring together. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Yeah, against Jerusalem. And uh, they want to stop the work. Well, Nehemiah says, no, we're not going to stop the work. Nevertheless, verse 9, we made our prayer to our God because of them. We set a watch against them day and night. So now he starts to put security, guards, starts to arm the people against this all-out attack. And so he, again, leads in prayer. And uh, they corporately pray, by the way. Uh, Nehemiah prays often, but now he gets the people praying with him against the enemies. They corporately pray and uh, share with God, of course, what their situation is. They're trusting him, and they increase the guard around the clock. Well, then the next thing starts in verse 10. Physical exhaustion. The people are working hard. I mean, half a wall in three or four weeks. And now they have to guard against all this fear, all these uh, armies that are out there preparing to attack them. They're physically, emotionally exhausted. And so the people come and say, you know what? Uh, we can't continue to work. We're exhausted. And the security problems and so on. Verse 10, the strength of the laborers is failing. There's so much rubbish. We're not able to build the wall. Our adversary says they'll know and either know or see anything till we come into their midst and kill them. They are... Now they've kind of given up an all-out assault because, uh, well, the people are ready behind half that wall. But, you know, there's still holes in the wall and weak spots, and we can sneak in and kill them off, you know, two by two, three by three. And so now the people are fearful of that. And Nehemiah responds, of course, by increasing security in the weak areas, on the hilltops and in the valleys, and so on. He's got placing extra security. Now he's got to change his plan, right? He really wants to get the wall built. He's pulling workers off the line to become guards now, but that's what he's got to do. He's got to do that to get his vision, and so he does it. And he encourages the people to trust God and to fight hard if need be. Notice the families are together. Father is guarding this part of the wall, this hole in the wall that's being worked on, and who's behind him if he falls back and runs from the enemy? His wife, his daughters. And so he's not going to do that. Again, they're invested fully in getting this project done. Nehemiah, um, and notice he reminds them, verse 14, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome. That word comes from the word fear. Oh, they've got plenty of fear from the enemy. Nehemiah says, Forget about that fear. That's nothing compared to the awesome, fearful God that we have. And we fear him more and the project he's given us than we fear the enemy. I remember I read a couple weeks ago, a pastor from Vietnam under threat uh, because he's preaching the gospel and leading a church. He says, you know, we, less, more than we fear their threats, we fear God who told us 
to minister and to spread the gospel. And so this is what Nehemiah is saying. We have an awesome God, and it's him that we fear, and it's him that we're obeying. That's why we're doing this. While ordinary fear paralyzes a person, godly fear leads to submission and obedience to God. Nehemiah revises his plan, but he understood the balance between walking by faith and leading strategically. His trust was in God, yes, but at the same time, he didn't abandon his responsibility to do all that he could to fulfill his vision strategically. Don't abandon a God-given vision simply because your plans for accomplishing it fail. Be willing to adjust those plans. So Nehemiah increases the guard by having even half of his own servants uh, go back to carrying weapons. Each worker's carrying his weapon, so he's ready all the time. Might have slowed down their work, but they've got to be ready to, uh, to protect themselves. He establishes an emergency system whereby people could be summoned to help one another. The trumpeter is going to stand by him. If they hear the trumpet, wherever, that's where they're going to rally to fight the enemy. He encourages them that God will fight for them, verse 20. The people who lived outside of Jerusalem are now required to stay within the city overnight. Night would be the time in the darkness when the, uh, obviously the people would want to attack, so on. What can we learn from this? Visions are open to attack by others for two reasons. Your vision to have the best marriage God wants you to have, or raise your children, or accomplish something for God, or you know, affect somebody at school, or whatever it is, number one, people don't like change. And so they resist change. And you know, even your own mate or even your own children, if you say, you know, we need to change this because this would be better, this is what God wants, they're going to say, oh, no, we kind of like it the way it is. Local churches, we talk about, you know, we could better fulfill God's vision for the local church and accomplish for him what he wants us to do if we made this change. And people say, no, 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 we've never done it that way before, the famous last words of the church, right? No, we, we are comfortable with where we are. And that is one of the reasons that people put up hindrances to a vision. Well, that is the same for Nehemiah. That is the same for us. Nehemiah's enemies said for 70 years, the walls have not been around Jerusalem. We've been able to run the place and have great influence. We don't want any change. And so they're resisting it. Well, someone might say, we tried that already. You know, we, the, the people could have said, we tried to rebuild this wall already, and the king stopped us last time. Why should we try again? Uh, why should we change the status quo? Whatever. Um, I, well, notice the message that Jesus gave to the seven churches in Revelation. As you read Revelation 2 and 3, he's commenting on each church, seven churches. Yes, he, com you know, he compliments them for certain things, but without fail, Every single one of them, he says, you need to change this or else you're not going to be an overcomer. You're not going to receive the reward at the end of every church passage in Revelation 2 and 3 is a reward, an eternal reward promised. And every time Jesus said, you need to change, you need to do this better, you're not fulfilling my great commission this way. Change, change, and yet we resist that. The second reason that our visions are open to attack and hesitation is that there are gaps in them. You and I don't know all of the future, right? I mean, think about it with me. God tells Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. He doesn't tell him all the details about it. Doesn't tell him that you're going to be up against the Red Sea with your back against the wall and the Egyptian army there. You know, Moses has got to trust him and deal with it as God tells him at the moment how to deal with it. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Gabriel comes to her and announces that God's vision for her life, at least this part of it, is that somehow miraculously the Son of God is going to be born from her. There's a lot of things she doesn't know the how about that. She asks the question, doesn't she? how can that be? I mean, I'm a virgin, I've never known a man. Gabriel just says God wants you to trust him. It's going to be miraculous. Lots of things she doesn't know. Now, she goes to get sidetracked, goes to Bethlehem for this silly census, um, on a donkey all those days, uh, ready to give birth. And she gives birth to this baby in Bethlehem in a stable, in a cave. And the shepherds come. Okay, so this must be some truth to this. God is sending the shepherds to worship him. But there's a lot of things that aren't right here. 
I mean, this is, if this is the Son of God, is he the King, the Messiah, then this is not the way it ought to be. I mean, we ought to be in a better place. And how are we going to get him in the position of being raised as a prince, a king? All these things Mary doesn't take responsibility for. She just ponders all of it in her heart and trusts God, right? She didn't set out to try to solve all those things. She just did her part of this vision. There are gaps. There are, if God tells you to do something, he doesn't tell you all of the turns and closed doors and different doors that open and all of the detours and changes along the way. And yet you and I are tempted to give up the vision. When things don't go the way we think our plan should go, we say, well, forget that. Satan's you know, whispering and his demonic force is saying, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that isn't working. You know, God doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, he does. But he doesn't tell us all the details of that plan. However, we need to, like Nehemiah, stay focused on the vision and be willing to adapt the plan. We need to be able to change and adapt and say, okay, with today and the world we are and whatever, we need to minister and get the gospel out in this way. Or in raising my family uh, with these things that go on at school and all of those things, we need to adapt. We need to uh, deal with them in this way. God wants us to have a marriage that stands out as a testimony to his power. He wants us to be able to parent our children so that they're mature and focused as the arrows, as the Old Testament said, that can be launched for God. God wants every local church to be the force for his eternal kingdom that is capable of attacking the gates of hell. You remember that verse, don't you? Uh, we looked at it last week, actually, that to God says, you're Peter, you're, your name, Simon, your name's going to be Peter, and on this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Unfortunately, we get the idea that, uh, well, that's protective. We need to put our church, build walls, and um, make sure we're safe inside. No, the only way that uh, the gates of hell cannot prevail is if we're attacking hell. If we are out there in the lost world, getting the gospel to lost people, the gates of hell cannot stop us. We are to be offensive. We are to be aggressive. We are to be on the attack. We have seen today that Nehemiah is always overcoming all of these hindrances and problems and not getting sidetracked, no matter what it was. In order to accomplish our vision, we need to overcome hindrances. Nehemiah does not allow false accusations to stop him. He prays and he reemphasizes the confidence that God gives in their success. Nehemiah gives credit to those who help to accomplish the goal. Nehemiah adapts his plan and defends his workers from attack. Every vision has a spiritual element to it. You might be tempted to sit here this morning and say, oh, well, my vision is to start a business or my vision is to, um, you know, make this happen to help people or whatever. There's nothing spiritual about it. There's nothing that's not spiritual about your life. Once you put your faith in Christ, you are God's child. Everything you do, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Everything you do has a spiritual part to it. God is interested in the whole thing. As a good parent, there's nothing your child does that you're not interested in. God is interested in your life no matter what you do. And there's nothing secular for a believer at all. Oh, you might have an occupation where you don't earn your living from a, from a you know, fully you know, minister you know, profession or whatever. That's not the issue. Everything you do in your life has a spiritual element in it because you're a child of God. And so... There are no secular pursuits. How, the question for us to ask, how can my heavenly father be glorified through this that he's given me to do? How am I going to glorify God? We mentioned last week about Ron Blue setting out to teach people about finances. But his goal is that someday if believers handle their finances properly, maybe the people that are, are affected by this teaching can give a billion dollars to God's kingdom work on earth in a year. See, no matter what you do, what is the connection to God's will and what he wants to accomplish? If you let your critics get to you, your flame will go out. Your vision will die. And if your vision dies, if you give it up, a part of you will die with it. What is it that God wants you to do? You know how it happens. A young lady sets out to marry a Christian man. I mean, she wants to meet and marry some young, 
man who is a strong believer so he can give the kind of spiritual leadership to their marriage and their home. But you know, friends, say, oh, come on. I mean, there's no such guys out there anymore. And you know, that's just too hard. You're passing up all these other guys who are kind of interested in you, but you're not satisfied with them. I think your standards are too high. If she listens to them, her vision dies and she settles for some, something much, much less. A father who wants to see his daughter come back to live for God and bring her life in line with biblical principles and really live for him. But you know, his friends say, oh, come on, leave her alone. Kids are just that way today. I mean, you have to give her space. She has to make her own way in the world. Makes sense to him. His vision dies. When Jeremy got married, he vowed to be faithful to his wife. But the guys who work have a totally different concept and philosophy, and they have a different goal for Jeremy, and they're constantly working on him. Now, faithfulness is a thing of the past. Nobody does that anymore today. Look at all the opportunities you're passing up. Hey, that secretary is very interested in you, really. And you know, Jeremy, if he listens to that, he gives in. Not only does he allow his vision to die, he automatically kills his wife's vision as well. Local churches say, wow, we ought to be reaching our world for Jesus Christ. What can we do to reach it? But again, well, every other church is kind of like this. We're just happy and satisfied to have good fellowship with inside our church. Unfortunately, there are many believers who look at brand new brand new uh, believers who come to faith in Christ and they're on fire and they're telling all their friends about what God did in their life. And too many times the attitude of us who've been believers for a while are, well, give them a little time. They'll mature. They'll settle down. They'll become like all the rest of us. And the vision dies. What is it that God has for you to do? And how does it affect God and his kingdom? Don't you get sidetracked by that vision, by hindrances, by other voices, by all kinds of things trying to stop you. Yes, you need to be willing to adapt your plan and say, well, this isn't quite working. I think I'll change a little bit. Uh, adapt, but don't give up your vision. Let me close with a quote by Andy Stanley. When God gives you a vision or points you in a direction, the issue is not your ability or feasibility of the project. The issue is, will you follow through with what you know to do? Will you do what you can do and trust God to do what only he can do? Nehemiah did. What a great model he is for us. God, thank you for this story of Nehemiah. Thank you even for putting in Scripture all these names of these people who were faithful to follow your vision for getting this wall built, what was important to you. God, help us to understand the vision you have for our life. Help us not to deviate from that no matter how hard the hindrances are. We know that Satan would like to sidetrack us and stop us. Yes, help us to be uh, not set on our plan. Help us to be able to adapt that as you send uh, all kinds of uh, curves and changes and corners and what in to uh, get us to do it the way you want us to do it. But help us to stick by that vision and not let it die. Help us to be faithful servants, stewards of yours. Father, thank you that there's an eternal reward waiting for those who are faithful. And may we be that faithful ambassador for you in Jesus' name. Amen.